game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm speaking today with Adriana Limbach. Adriana is a meditation instructor, personal development coach, and the author of the book, Tea and Cake with Demons. Her work has been featured by the New York Times, Refinery29, Women's Health, and Yoga Journal. She's been hosting group coaching programs for coaches in training at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition since 2009, and is currently a lead teacher at Mindful, that's Mindful with no vowels, Meditation mm -hmm. Studio, where she is a mentor and faculty for their 300-hour teacher training program. Welcome to the Meta Hour, Adriana. Sharon, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, yeah. So huge congratulations on your book. This is your first book, right? It is my first book. Yep. That's an amazing milestone. That's really, that's really great. So um, to start with, why don't we talk about some of your journey, how you started meditating, um, and your path to teaching? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's such a funny thing to talk about because I, I feel like anything, it seems like all, all of the dots kind of connect in, in retrospect. Um, but of course, you know, it was not ever that linear. Um, yeah. So I first started meditating um, back in high school. I was a, a junior in high school and I grew up in Wisconsin. Uh, you'll hear the hard vowels. And it was um, a, a college town that I lived in. It was a pretty small town, but it was a college town. So, you know, during the semesters, it would kind of like ripe into three times its size. Um, and the the campus that I went to high school at didn't really have kind of enough room for all of us uh, to, to physically be there. So uh, the way that it was set up is kind of uh, with electives. So we were able to take different courses to fulfill different requirements. And, and one of the history courses that was offered was a class called A History of Great Ideas. And I didn't know what it was when I was signing up for it. I just knew that I wanted to take a class with this particular teacher. His name is Mr. Siebert. And I would see him walking around the high school, uh, really grumpy guy. He was always kind of like a little mm -hmm. disheveled and very grumpy. And um, But he had such a, a, a kind of like funny sweetness to him, just like a wonderful weirdo. Uh, I was like, all right, I want to take a class with this guy. The only class that he teaches is a history of great ideas. And it turned out to be... Uh, a class on Eastern philosophy. Uh, so we studied Taoism and Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, and that was my my first sort of real taste of meditation and, and also uh, Buddhist view. And and I remember so clearly kind of this, this real arrow to the heart moment um, in class. Uh, he was, you know, talking about one of the, the kind of hallmarks of, of Buddhist view is uh, the idea of non-self, that we, we don't exist inherently mm -hmm. the way that we think that we do. Um, and I remember what a kind of terrifying feeling it was even to hear him say that of like, oh, I, you know, I am the prom queen. I work very hard on the way that I exist in the world. Like, what do you mean I don't exist the way that I think that I do? Um, and it was just enough for me to um, decide that I wanted to learn more. Like it really haunted me. It was it was a very unsettling feeling. Um, 
that I um, couldn't shake. And so I, I wanted to explore more. So um, I started in high school meditating and, and kind of uh, looking around for whatever resources were available. Of How did you learn what to do? Yeah, I, there was basic instruction that was given in our mm -hmm. in our class, um, and then I just started uh, kind of like digging up resources. Uh, I fell in love with Alan Watts. He was kind of one of the the big firsts, uh, going to the library and and taking out his cassettes, <laughs> his like lectures on tape. Um, and so that was my my first kind of foray into to meditation. And then after high school, um, I decided to do a little bit of traveling just as a way of prolonging that inevitable question of, you know, what do you want to do with your life, which uh, always felt a little um, kind of confining and, and, and solid and, and terrifying in its own right. So I decided to do some traveling, um, ended up in, in Thailand, um, and that mm -hmm. gave me kind of like another hit of exposure, um, just enough to sort of pique my interest and my curiosity. And then I ended up moving to New York City, um, you know, just to, maybe as another way of kind of infinitely prolonging the answer to the question, mm -hmm. what do you want to do with your life? I'm like, well, I'll move to New York and maybe I'll figure it out there. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, living in New York, 19, 20, stopped meditating, started partying, having a really good time. Um, found myself at 25 having kind of the, the like classic, what we would call now quarter life crisis of, you know, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I live in the most expensive city in the world. I'm not where I thought that I would be or should be, or, um, you know, I, I don't actually want to pursue this thing that I've been going to school for, which was costume design at Parsons. Um, and I, I felt like a wreck. I felt like everybody else has their life figured out mm -hmm. except for me. I have no idea what I'm doing, and I am a total failure at 25 years old. Um, and my roommate at the time was taking classes at the Interdependence Project uh, down on the Bowery, and she said, you know, hey, you know that that meditation thing that you used to do? That might actually be really helpful for you right now, um, which is, you know, how I found myself kind of walking up all of those flights of stairs. Oh, I remember those stairs. <laughs> At 302 Bowery. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that that was a consistent space to, to drop back into um, because, of course, she was right in the middle of my kind of, you know, identity crisis and panic. Meditation actually was an incredibly helpful thing to mm -hmm. plug back into. This is very interesting to me both because, um, well, also because I, I started my acquaintance really with the Buddhist teaching in college in a class, mm -hmm. an Asian philosophy class, but um, there was no hint of a method, you know, of, of an actual how-to yeah. put these principles and these values in, into practice. And that's how I ended up going to India as a, an independent study student and actually learning a method and so in a way, it sounds like you started without the ability to ask anybody any questions, right? You just had some ideas about what to do and you put it into practice on your own. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which um, I remember you talking a lot about in your book, Faith, and I mm -hmm. have to thank you for because your book, Faith, was so pivotal to me, um, particularly, you know, in that like... 24, 25 range when I was kind of just rediscovering mm -hmm. my practice. Um, and it was such a, a, a personal account of your own experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, um, you know, really made it feel so relatable. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the Interdependence Project was the first time, well, not Thailand, I guess, was the first time that you had a more explicit sense of guidance and the ability to ask questions, which seems very important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did after that, that course in high school, um, you know, came to its inevitable conclusion. I found myself just kind of like floating um, and scratching around for resources, but, you know, not actually, you know, as you're saying, being able to have a dialogue with other mm -hmm, people, mm -hmm. uh, with teachers or community or mm -hmm. just kind of uh, winging it. <laughs> Well, of course, even um, now this wasn't so many years ago for you, but uh, enough so that it's it feels like the landscape is different in terms of availability and accessibility of 
um, these core principles and certainly methods that are that are much more available now. So it's different. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Google, yeah. we can find anything that we want or need in 30 seconds or less, um, which, you know, I personal opinion, uh, feel like it, it comes with its own set of challenges because um, the information is so readily available um, and not necessarily kind of vetted in a way um, that we're, we're sort of, the landscape is flooded. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it maybe requires a, a bit of extra digging onto its own right, um, yeah, to, to kind of sift through all of the, the information that's out there. It's true. Like I say, people say to me sometimes, how do I find a teacher? Or how do I find a sitting group to be part of? And I say, well, if I'm going to a, a town that I've never been to before, I might just Google insight meditation in the name of the town. And then I realized, well, they don't know necessarily to put in insight meditation, you know. And I wonder what would come up if you just put in meditation in the name of the town. It would probably be a big variety. And how do you know? How do you know? How do you choose? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really great question. How do you choose? How do you choose? And particularly if you're just looking for meditation, um, because, you know, there, there are so many different types of meditation, um, both uh, kind of uh, traditional meditation uh, that comes from some kind of lineage and, and also like, you know, uh, meditation that maybe is just makes you feel good for a few minutes, but doesn't necessarily uh, have kind of a, a, a root or a source that is traceable. Um, yeah. So have you found yourself sort of in a translation project of taking what sounds like um, teachings that you received in a fairly traditional environment, certainly with an Asian root, you know, in sense of lineage, and translating those into kind of our contemporary world and the language that would make sense now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is interesting, especially since uh, Mindful, Mindful Without the Vowels, uh, opened up. Um, it, it seems like there's this kind of trajectory that I, I see happen over and over again um, with people who walk through the doors of mindful, which is um, there's a, a large portion of people who come in and they say, you know, I've been meditating with an app. I started with uh, Headspace or Insight Timer or one of these other apps and, um, you know, it worked for a little while. Like I, I got some benefit out of it and then it started to fall off maybe like a month or two or three in or I hit a plateau. You know, it got like really sort of stale for me. And and so they walk into mindful asking the question, you know, what's next? What what else is there? Um, and what they uh, seem to generally find at mindful is that practicing meditation in a dedicated space with community, with other practitioners that they can have conversations with and share experiences with, um, and also live teachers that do come from some kind of background, some sort of lineage, um, is incredibly helpful in terms of the expansion of their practice. Like it really sort of adds a, another dimension and answers this question of what's mm -hmm. next. Um, but then, you know, inevitably, and, and this kind of just also sort of speaks to samsara that there's there's another question of like ooh okay but but now what's next like what's what's next after this um and it it seems to be what i'm finding um is sort of underneath that question what people are really asking for is um but what what is the view or or what are the teachings that actually give this practice some context um because i'm i'm sitting here and i'm watching my breath for 30 minute, 45 minute periods in community, which is great with live teachers, which is great, but it, it still feels like uh, it's a little flat. It's a little two dimensional. Um, and um, it, it seems to be that when there is a little bit more of the, the view that's introduced that gives the meditation practice context um, is when it, it really comes alive for people and, and becomes much more kind of applicable. It sort of answers this question of, yeah, but how does this translate into my daily life? Like, how does this translate into my difficult relationship with my partner and, you know, all of my kind of feelings at work? Um, so, so 
coming back to your question, you know, am I, am I finding myself in a project of translation? That's a really great question. I never actually thought about it that way. Um, I, I find myself really trying in, in the way that I know how to, to sort of answer this question that I, I see coming up in classes all the time, which is, yeah, but, but like, what else is there? Like, what else is mm-hmm. next? Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, um, from my perspective is view, a little bit of view. So that brings us to your book, mm-hmm. um, Tea and Cake with Demons, A Buddhist Guide to Feeling Worthy. So those are interesting word choices. First of all, demons and then Buddhist. Um, so the book was released in July of 2019 from Sounds True. What inspired you first of all to write the book and to use those terms oh mm-hmm. yeah um <laughs> um well the marketing team at sounds true thought it was a really great title <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, well, the, it lends itself to images right away it's like Oh, would you like to see my uh, tea party? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> His demons are very provocative, right? Um, yeah. What inspired me to write the book? Um, you know, I think it was in part um, this question of of what's next. Um, this this kind of um, asking for for some kind of traditional view to give meditation practice context um, and deep in practice. A, a big part of why I wanted to write about the topic that I wrote about, which is um, self-worth and all that obscures it, aka our demons, um, is that for the past decade or so, I've been hosting these group coaching programs for the integrate for the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Um, which is so cool. It's so cool. I am I'm I'm gathering with um, these sort of relative strangers at first, but you know, if, over the course of six weeks, we all become uh, good friends and very intimate um, from across thirty five different countries. So the school is huge, and they have students from uh, thirty five different countries. And and I've I found myself um, semester after semester and year after year in these groups of. Um, predominantly women, some men, but predominantly women. Um, and the conversation would inevitably turn to feelings of self-doubt and, um, you know, this question of like, you know, who do I think I am? I'm not smart enough. I'm not, I, I don't have enough resources. I don't have enough time. I'm not like thin enough or pretty enough or, um, you know, well-studied enough or, um, well connected enough or you know just this this kind of like bottomless I'm not enough in whatever way shape or form and um, I found it was really interesting because it's people from a- across so many different lines of positionality right people from uh, different countries and different backgrounds and different belief systems and different um, socioeconomic statuses and and um, but it seemed like there was this one common, kind of mm-hmm. um, fear or, or question that people were asking, um, which is why, why don't I feel like I'm good enough? Um, and it is kind of the, I talk about this a bit in the book, it's, it's kind of the, <clears throat> like the, the biologist um, sort of view of, you know, if you see one fish wash up on the shore, it's probably, you know, it's a dead fish, no big deal. But if you start to see thousands of fish washing up, you test the water. Like, what's going on in the water? Um, and it seemed to dovetail really nicely with my own exploration of meditation and, and Buddhism um, and how, just frankly, helpful I found that it was to have some kind of framework that is consistently like reorienting our worldview back towards um enoughness and basic goodness that we are fundamentally okay we have we have fundamental wellness um and that yeah sure there's there's you know some stuff that piled up on top or obscurations or you know demons um but that there's nothing wrong with us there's there's actually Mm -hmm. nothing we don't need to be fixed we're whole and complete and sufficient just the way that we are um and and having a a 
a practice and a set of teachings that was continually kind of pointing back to that and giving me the experience of that most importantly, not just in theory, but the actual experience of it. Um, I was like, yeah, there's, this is, this is, this is useful to me. And this is something that I, I see people consi- consistently struggling with. Um, so that was, that was kind of the, the impetus for the book. So um, this is a a quotation from the book. Uh, For each of us, this demon material is unique, like our own neurotic thumbprint. It's in our difficult emotions, confused states of mind, and the unintegrated aspects of ourselves that cloud our Buddha nature. So what you're saying, I guess, is that the um, times that we find the roughest, the most disappointing about ourselves, uh, where we're not living up to some standard that we have imposed or the world has imposed upon us that we've taken on, those are the times that actually could be the most transformational, the richest in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, potentially. Potentially, yes. Potentially, yes. Um, what do you think the um, uh, consequence of that is? Because there's a certain way in which we need to accept and even love those parts of ourselves, you know, rather than reject them and be so afraid and so ashamed and all of that. But we also don't want them to dominate necessarily. We don't want them to run our lives and our choices and and so on. So there's a path somehow where the opening um, doesn't lead to acquiescence. It leads to something else. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, I, I just know from my own experience, it's been so helpful to to kind of understand, um, understand and respect and, and come to sort of embrace um, all of my neurotic aspects, like the, the parts of myself that, you know, maybe I learned along the way that I should be ashamed of or I had some sort of uh, experience that that made me really um, fearful to, to show these parts of myself to other people. Um, and so, you know, the, the kind of, um, strategies that are put in place to, um, like never kind of witness or interact with, or, you know, God forbid, show these, these parts of myself to other people. Um, and, and just the ability to, um, sort of turn my attention there as a, as a potential source of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, you you know, this is, if the theory is that I am whole and complete and sufficient just the way that I am, whole means the entirety, whole means all of it. And Mm -hmm. so um, maybe that does include the aspects of myself um, that I'm I'm not so proud of. I always think about it for myself. It's it's in the moments when I feel really overwhelmed or under-resourced, where I'm like, ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. There's, there's my, you know, demon material. Um, that's when, you know, the the parts of who I am that I, I don't necessarily appreciate come to the forefront. Um, and to your point, yeah, I, I think that there is something about um, being able to uh, witness and befriend and integrate these aspects of ourselves um, as aspects of wisdom. Um without necessarily like giving them the wheel. It's kind of like here, climb into the passenger seat. We're going to go for a ride, but you know, please don't place your hands on the wheel. Like, and, and please like, I, I don't even want you to tune the radio. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I see you. I see you. Thank you for the information. And also, um, you know, this is maybe not who's, who's in the driver's seat here. So what do you mean by aspects of wisdom or thank you for the information? Like what information do we get from finally sitting down, you know, and uh, paying attention in a different way to these forces? Yeah. I mean, just to make it really specific, I think for myself, um, I've always been incredibly prone to anger, um, you know, to the point of like rage like particularly righteous anger. There's something that's so deeply satisfying about I'm right. 
I'm right and you are wrong. Um, and that way I get to like hold this sort of vaulted position of like of just righteousness. Um, and it, it feels good. It feels really powerful in the moment. And, you know, I think that is the tipping point of like, ooh, this could really kind of take the wheel here um, because it does feel kind of satisfying to be in the right and to be so angry. Um, and I, I think the the wisdom aspect of that, just speaking for myself, is that it really is a way of reclaiming some kind of um, power over my vulnerability, mm. like reclaiming some kind of um, some kind of feeling of agency in the moments when I feel the most vulnerable uh, as a protective mechanism. And so I, I think that the wisdom there is, um, oh, I am, you know, I feel incredibly threatened in this moment and it, it feels powerful to be in a place of righteous anger. Um, but then also looking at, you know, is there some truth here? Is there some truth here when I, when I drop the satisfaction of the feeling of anger? Like what, it, what is this actually pointing to? Is there some sort of, um, injustice or or wrongdoing at play um that that this is in response to uh, and what what might it mean to um sort of hold hold that truth of what's being revealed here um without necessarily letting my anger kind of burn the house down mm -hmm. um so so i think you know in 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 any of these aspects um that there's 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 some truth. It, it's pointing to the the truth of our experience in some some real way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now my mind was playing. What about greed? What about this? What about that? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting. So when I was first practicing uh, Buddhism and learning meditation, it was in a certain within a certain tradition, and it was in a certain context. So. Within that context, um, say in the beginning of a retreat, an intensive retreat, you would actually recite the five precepts that were going to be the underpinning of your life for that 10-day period or however long the retreat was, uh, not harming another, not killing, not stealing, and so on. And so um, one of the functions of having that kind of code of ethics and I should say these are guidelines. They're called training precepts. They're about awareness. They're not about punishment or, you know, having done wrong and failing. It's a different sort of mode. But anyway, one of the benefits I discovered from having that kind of context was that I could more befriend, in a way, the forces that came up in my mind without having this fear like, oh, that's going to that's gonna blossom into action. Like, I might really want your beautiful med meditation shawl and, you know, long for it and want it. But I know because of that commitment, I'm not going to, like, reach my hand out, you know, when you're not in the room <laughs> and, like, pull it away and hide it in my, in my suitcase, you know. I'm not going to steal it. And in a way, that gave me permission to really let it rip, that desire. Mm. You know, I, I could be with it. I could look at it. I didn't have to think, what if, you know, it takes me over. Um, and, and so it's, it's a funny way of looking at ethics, you know, to see that it really allows us to hang out with those demons and say, okay, you know, this is a part of what arises in my mind. I don't have to sit here quaking, you know, like, am I going to start stealing? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do that? Let me really just be with this feeling in and of itself. And so uh, that just occurred to me, you know, as sort of an ethical context that actually makes us less afraid. Yeah. 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 That's such a great point is, you know, maybe the, the concern of like, what kind of person will I become if I even allow this to be um, a part of my experience? Mm -hmm. Like, nope, nope. Just put it in a box keep it at bay. Um, yeah. It, you know, I'm thinking about um, a couple of months ago, I was teaching meditation uh, at a, a, a like multinational bank, um, which is always a very funny experience because I'm so used to just like sitting on the floor barefoot and mm -hmm. suddenly I'm at the front of a boardroom table. Like, okay, I'm going to tell you something very important now about feelings. Um, and 
you know, we, we talked, we practiced afterwards, there was some Q and A and there was a woman who uh, raised her hand and, and she said, um, you know, like, have you ever seen somebody who's had a really uh, adverse reaction to meditation? And I thought about it and I was like, you know, I, I, I personally haven't. I personally haven't seen anybody have just like a really terrible reaction to meditation. You know, sometimes you read stories about it. It's oftentimes when, you know, people decide the best way to learn how to meditate is to go on a 10-day silent retreat, which I like really appreciate the spirit of go big or go home, but maybe not the most supportive environment to learn how to meditate. Um, well, actually, I learned how to meditate that way. Did you? I'd say probably 50%. <laughs> I don't know about now, but... For a long, long, long time, about 50% of the people who'd come to the Insight Meditation Society were beginners Wow! for an intensive silent retreat. I think it's not the most conducive way for everybody, you know? Right. And and there are big environmental factors like the silence, you know, and the fact that nobody's looking at you. And that might make it really not a good choice for somebody. In a particular mode. And and that's one of the interesting things about our time is that mm-hmm. now, you know, we ask how many people are new to IMS, but, you know, maybe they've been meditating every day with an app, you know, so they're not really new to meditation, something like that. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a really great point is that um, – it it it's sort of just assumed now that um you you've kind of dipped your toe into the water with like a fifteen minute or mm-hmm, a thirty mm-hmm, minute or mm-hmm. a, um whereas you know that wasn't always no it definitely available. I mean there was no choice there, there were I mean there was nothing you know <laughs> it was just <laughs> retreats and yeah that's how you had to do it and for most people it's fine it's not fine for everybody you know yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you for the thank you for that clarification. Yeah, she um she approached me afterwards and and she said, um, you know, I asked because I had an adverse reaction to meditation. And I was like, Oh, you know, what 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 happened? She said, I, I just felt so heavy. Um I said, Oh, you know, like mentally heavy, emotionally heavy, physically heavy, like what? Um and it was like it was like touching a, a a bubble that was ready to pop. She just welled up with tears. Um, I was like, oh, that's the adverse reaction to meditation um, is that you encountered something internally that that doesn't actually feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that can be really shocking to people because they're, you know, I think that there is um, sort of this maybe assumption um, in modern day meditation, that um, it's going to make you feel good. That's its purpose. The mm-hmm, purpose of meditation mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. to feel good. Uh, and you're going to sit down and all of the stress is going to drain out of your body and you're going to sleep like a baby that night. And this is what meditation is for. Um, and, and so it was it was a real shock to her to the point that she described it as having a bad reaction to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think a, a one of my motivations behind this book was was really, you know, again with this question of people who are 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 having a, a daily meditation practice at this point, maybe asking the question of like, what's next? Um, to to really underscore the fact that um, when we inevitably encounter ourselves in meditation, our own mind, our own emotions, our own hangups, um, our own neuroses, that that doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. Mm-hmm. That that's you know, that's, that's okay. That's okay. You're not doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad meditation. Did you do an audio version of the book? I'm curious. I didn't. I didn't. Um, Yeah, that might be in the future. That might be in the cards, but yeah. Because I was thinking, um, see, this is sort of what I meant in the beginning of our conversation when I said you started without the ability to ask questions. (laughs) Because there are many, many moments for anybody where we could use some reassurance or reminders. It's okay, you know, this path is not all bliss and light. There's there's something meaningful in being able to sit with one's sadness and uh, pain and, you know, and, and discomfort. But you have to do it skillfully because the idea isn't to suffer. You know, the idea is to really develop a different relationship. And... um 
you know, so I thought, oh, well, someone could keep reading your book. But then I thought it would be nice to just have it in your voice, sort of reminding you, like, it's okay. You know, you're sitting with some demons. and um, Because it, there's also the question of how long do you sit there? You know, you don't want to get exhausted. And um, it can't be the only thing. You need to bring some resource, as you said, mm-hmm. to the table. You know, you're not sitting there gritting your teeth and, like, begging to endure, you know, there's a whole relationship to that. I don't want to say demonic energy, but, you know, the <laughs> difficult energy um, that you're developing, that you're cultivating. And so what are the components of that different relationship? You talk about love, mm-hmm. you know, and you talk about confronting perfectionism and being able to loosen the grip of, of some of these habits that we have. Um, and that's really important, you know, for people to understand is that it's not just like this naked confrontation, you know, with something that's very, very difficult, but right. you're really building resource. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think something that I personally found so helpful about um, the framework of the the Four Noble Truths um, is that it just kind of normalized my situation in a mm-hmm, lot of ways mm-hmm, of like mm-hmm. oh yeah you know it's you're, you're it's hard to be a human being you're gonna have really difficult moments um and you're absolutely not alone in that and and, and you know it actually even carries the potential um to um open our hearts in a way that gives us access to greater empathy to really um be able to um not only hold space and bear witness to our own suffering and our own perceived failings and, you know, our own quote unquote demons, um, but also to then be able to extend that kind of space and empathy to other people. Um, and, and like, how beautiful is that? Because on the other side is this, um, you know, at least what I've experienced, like this profound sense of connection, like, whoa, we are really in this together. We are really in this together. Um, that there, there is, you know, my 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 suffering is incredibly valid, but it is not at all unique. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of, I think, for me, took the personalization out of it, like not taking it so personally, um, and also, um, you know, gave me that that kind of footstool to to really being able to um, draw a line of connection to to everybody mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm which, um, you know, how lovely, how, how lovely. Um, yeah. So, so, um, I mean, I'm tempted to have you explain the four noble truths just in case there's somebody listening who is not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) I love this. I used to have a teacher that would make us run drills would be like four of this, eight of those. Um, so first noble. No, I should just say this is one of my bugaboos. It came from my own writing and being edited. Mm-hmm. Where uh, my first book was Loving Kindness, and I would get these comments back from uh, I had a freelance editor from the editor saying, um, "That's just jargon." Mm. Or what is noble silence? Nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> and I realized oh, I'm so used to making that assumption that. You know, now I hear even people using a word like dharma, Mm -hmm. and I realize there may be people in this room that don't know what that word means, which is used in different contexts. It could mean the Buddha's teaching. It could mean the truth. It could mean the laws of nature. Um, And and then, you know, we're so used to it. We just go on. So the stage is yours. What are the four noble truths? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to your point, I think it, it is always helpful just to have kind of a working definition. I even see this in, in like commonly used words like mindfulness is mm-hmm. like, okay, you know, we're using this so liberally, which is beautiful that it's such a part of our uh, conversational um, atmosphere, but but also it can be helpful to just have a working definition so that we're all sort of mm-hmm. on the same page. Um, so uh, first noble truth, um, truth of suffering or the truth of dissatisfaction, um, the way that I think about it is, you know, it's it's hard to be a human being. Being a human being means encountering difficulty. And there's a, a number of different kinds or, or flavors of difficulty that we'll, we'll encounter. Um, there's the, you know, the, the 
suffering of suffering or the dissatisfaction of dissatisfaction. Like, ouch, I stubbed my toe. We can all agree that's painful. It's a really painful experience. Um, there is the, the painful experience of impermanence that, you know, even if I have exactly the flavor that I want, I got like exactly the thing, oh my goodness, yay, um, sort of built into receiving the flavor that I want is that it's not going to last. And that in itself is, is painful. It's dissatisfactory. Um, and then, you know, what sounds really ominous is the dissatisfaction, the, the all pervasive suffering or all pervasive dissatisfaction, which, um, you know, is, is just kind of that feeling of like, mm, but like, I, I just want a little something more. Like, I just want a, like a, like a snack or like, there's nothing necessarily bad that's happening, but I, I just want to like, up level it a little bit like how can i just make this a little bit more tasty and sort of the re the restlessness that results from never really being able to settle into our experience which is what all pervasive um suffering or dissatisfaction points to so a second noble truth um is that if we're experiencing dissatisfaction in a lot of different forms uh and just by virtue of being a human being um there's a reason for it there's a really good reason for it um and it's it points back to the three root poisons which is um that there's some kind of experience that we always want to be having and desire thirst greed and it's sort of inflamed version and there's always some sort of experience that we want to be avoiding um aggression, aversion, and that we're always kind of trapped in the the tension between the two. Like, I want this and I don't want that. Um, I think advertising does such a great job of this, of like, you know, have this experience without giving anything up, without having the experience you don't want to have. Like, you know, have the, have the love of your life without sacrificing your individuality. Um, so always kind of like caught in the tension of, I want this, I don't want that. Um, desire, aggression, aversion. Um, and then um, what what kind of props it all up, that, that kind of like underlining baseline is ignorance, um, that we have no idea we're on this cycle all day long, every moment of our lives, of always kind of fiddling with our experience to have the exact kind of experience that we want to be having while not having any of the stuff that we don't want to have. Um, we have no sense that this is happening, ignorance. Um, and, and also um, the ignorance of, of really sort of self-identifying with our circumstances. You know, when things are good, I'm good. Mm -hmm. When things are bad, I'm bad. Um, and, and really sort of internalizing that and taking that to heart and, and feeling like, well, this is who I am in the world. I am my circumstances. I am my experience. Um, third noble truth is, um, you know, the good news. Yay. There's a, there's a, a way to get off of this treadmill, a way off this hamster wheel, um, which leads to the fourth noble truth, which is the eightfold path, um, that there is actually a, a, a very holistic path of practice um, within the context of our lives, using our life as the grounds of practice um, for continually working with the causes of our dissatisfaction and the causes of our suffering, um, which, you know, is, is, so, is so beautiful. I think it's really, it's, it's beautiful to me that um, it sort of alchemizes our entire lives into a path of practice, path of working with, um, you know, what causes us so much dissatisfaction? How did you? You did great. <laughs> you did so great. You get an A plus. Yeah. Okay, and so that leads me to um, another quote from your book. Uh, For most of us, there's a moment when we receive the message that we're not quite good enough the way that we are. Perhaps there's a cultural standard that we become aware of, along with the place that we occupy in it. Maybe there's a family dynamic that expects something of us that we find ourselves unable to fulfill or a disappointment that's assigned to who we are rather than something that we did. Perhaps even the standard of good enough was learned to be rejected as mediocre, subpar. Okay is not actually okay. Mm. I felt myself just respond with all this compassion for our predicament, <laughs> you know, like reading this, like, look at how we struggle. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've always, um, you know, for myself, 
I've always had a really hard time with even the idea of enough. You know, what, what, what is enough? Um, and, and I, I, I see myself always kind of wanting to occupy one of the two polarities of like abundance, like more than enough. I have so much. Um, or, you know, when I, when I am not feeling abundant, kind of collapsing into poverty mentality of like, I'm, I'm not enough. I'm not enough in any of these ways. Again, going back to these conversations over the past 10 years of the ways in which we feel, um, kind of internally deficient um, in our own ways and, and, and kind of, um, how difficult I've always found it to, to, to find that resting point somewhere in the middle of like, um, just okay, just okay. And, and even in that word, okay, of like, but, but like, it's just okay. Right. We think of okay as being like, it, it's a C, C plus at best. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's like, baseline but you always want to get better you always want to get better and, I, and that's such a it is just such a um kind of invisible narrative in our culture of like always more always climbing always better you know what's like what what's the next thing like keep going don't settle um and and it it really is tough it just it feeds that struggle of, of never being able to rest in sufficiency and enoughness, uh, in, in plenty, um, which, yeah, you know, again, kind of going back to the second noble truth is like that tension, that continual tension that is an undercurrent in our everyday experience. Beautifully said. I'm wondering if, um, we could close with just your leading us in a short meditation. Yeah. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Okay, so whomever you are, wherever you are, just taking a moment to find a comfortable seat. It's letting yourself physically land if you haven't already. I'm on a chair, couch, floor, some sort of solid surface where your body can be supported. And then once we've landed, just taking a moment to locate your gaze. So eyes open or eyes closed. And if you're practicing with eyes open, just letting the gaze be soft, hazy, unfocused, three to five feet in front of you. And practicing with eyes closed, seeing if you can still maintain a sense of being alert and awake, uplifted. Just taking a few moments here to open our practice by opening our senses. And really just locating ourselves here in space. And so shifting the attention over to sound. Just receiving the sound of the room that you're in. And the tonal quality. Maybe any noises that are present. It's welcoming sound to be a part of our experience. And shifting the attention over to touch. So taking a few moments to really just feel into the body. Feeling where the body makes contact, that light pressure against the chair, the floor. Feeling where the body meets the body itself. Taking in the texture of clothing on our skin. Temperature of the air in the room. So really very little effort needed here. It's beginning to open up to what already is. Just the body here in space. Our direct experience of that. Mm. 
dropping the attention into the feet. Just feeling our feet here. Pressure of our shoes, texture of the socks, temperature of the air. It's bringing a bit of interest to the details. And tracing the attention across the shin bones. And circling the kneecaps, grazing through the thighs, landing in the hips. And bringing the attention to the belly, the chest. Maybe just resting here in the belly, the chest for a few beats. Just feeling into the space in the body. And oftentimes the storehouse of emotion in the body. Maybe just noticing if there's anything that feels particularly active or alive here. And what we're bringing into practice. Continuing to rest here in the front body, just beginning to establish contact with the body breathing. Just feeling the way the breath moves in the body today by its own volition. Wherever, however, the breath is most available in the body, it's dropping an anchor of attention here. Home base, the place that we return to. Just taking a few moments to practice with the singular instruction that as our minds wander, which they naturally will, just noticing when we've left our breathing, acknowledging what captures our attention, and then gently, firmly coming back to the breath in the body. And then in our final few moments here, let me just offering ourselves a little bit of sweetness, kind word, giving ourselves some credit for taking a bit of time, creating a little bit of space, treating our own company like it matters. And then 
perhaps closing out, just giving ourselves a few more deep inhales, deep exhales, wiggling the toes, rolling out the wrists, just bringing a little bit of movement into the body. And then as you're ready, just letting formal practice drop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And thank you so much for joining me today to speak. And if you would like to learn more about Adriana's work, you can check out her website at www.adrianalimbach. That's A-D-R-E-A-N-N-A-L-I-M-B-A-C-H dot com. Her book, Tea and Cake with Demons, is available in paperback and ebook formats wherever books are sold. And who knows, maybe someday an audio book. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks so much to all of you listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. And may you live with ease. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.